he was this little guy, but he could talk you into things, things you didn't want to do. Give him money. One guy even gave him his girlfriend. bunch of us together. It really wasn't a place for people to live back then. Uh, it, was, it was actually called Welfare Island when we were kids. And there was no tram, uh, just a bridge, and it went right over us. The place was nowhere. We grew up knowing a lot of people who were basically vagrants, just people who got left there when the hospital closed um, and didn't know anywhere else to go. It sucked. Roosevelt, welfare, whatever you call it, it just sucked. That's how we all saw it. That's what made it all so amazing. Us kids from nowhere had the run of the city. There were a couple of years there when Tommy and us could have made anything happen, anything. It's a shame. Especially when he was young, a lot of people wanted to kick the shit out of Tommy. But he always had a way of getting him to do what he wanted. Ask yourself, what is an alien? Right now I'm here sitting with you at this guy's house. My family's at another house a few blocks away. I'm not gonna say where, but you know, there they are. They got our stuff, we know the neighbors. It's a nice home. Then you go two, three blocks away, now you're in the bay. The fish and the sharks. Now you're the alien. Tommy never said how he met them, the connection or whatever. He said things, but he told different people different things. Like what kind of things? Like he met them camped out with the bums in Renwick, said they had a ship buried in garbage, leaves piled up uh, against one of the stone walls. He told someone they were Nazi war criminals who came up the river in a submarine, or he'd say that they were Iranian royalty or Japanese mafia, the Yahoos or whatever. You didn't ask who they were. Why would you? But over time, some of us guys did get to know the connection. There were things right off the bat. You'd go to a meet, and you'd see these lights flying over the water, just a few feet up, uh, no sound of an engine, um, nothing at all. Um, or someone would just be there with Tommy, and there was always something a little off about them. Even in the summer, wearing gloves. What I used to tell my partners is, you want the profits or do you want the receipts? Because I, I can do one. So what do you want? You want the money or do you want a story? You had Roosevelt Island, North Brother Island, South Brother Island, the Pelham Islands, the Blouses, Chimney Sweeps Islands, Half a City Island, Hot Island, High Island, Rat Island. We did a lot of business on Rat Island, uh, Mau Mau Island, Ruffle Bar, Ellis Island. We sold all the film and the popcorn there. Governor's Island, Liberty Island, uh, Mills Rock, Randall's Island, Belmont Island, Queens Hog Island for a while, Isle of Meadows, Prowls Island, Shooter's Island, Hoffman Island, uh, Swinburne Island. That's a lot of islands. Uh, and they were wide open for guys like us. One day, Tommy is this guy hustling nickels and dimes on a jet ski. Next day, it's that he's the one you gotta ask for something. And you gotta go get it on his boat. Overnight, it changed just like that. You know, we went from this nowhere crew selling some weed, some stolen deodorant and shit. Uh, and then one day Tommy just said, I can get us anything. 
what can we sell? And back in the beginning, I'd say VCRs, and he'd be back later in a week with 300 VCRs. Not in a truck or even on a pallet, sometimes not even in boxes, but they were new, just waiting for us. We'd take a Zodiac and some guys over to Mau Mau Island, and there they'd be. It was money for nothing, um, mostly. In the winter, it sucked. Uh, you'd have to get there before the stuff got wet. But other than that, it was like a miracle for guys like us. With our skill set, uh, our backgrounds, our tastes. Um. If, if you were an advanced civilization and someone gave you a laser disc player, I imagine that making one on your own would be about as hard as making a balloon dog for a child. We were a small crew with no established, like, recognized businesses. Uh, you don't start where we did and get where we did without ruffling a few feathers. You got to realize, at that time, the five families were very strict about video games. Arcade games were considered part of vending machines, and those belonged to very specific people, very particular people. And so the families didn't want to even hear about you moving a few Atari consoles in the city. After the ColecoVision unrest of 85 and 86, everyone sat down and agreed that certain friends of ours could sell the video game systems, but only in certain areas. Nassau, Westchester, Rockland, Suffolk, Jersey, except Hoboken. The rule with joysticks and the cartridges was simple. We were to restrict the business to the suburbs. The idea was they were animals anyway, so let them lose their souls. We had it all. Segas, Game Boys, everything. Games, the cheat codes. It got so that the Super Mario song gave me a hard on. We made that much money. One time we were getting a lot of heat from some of the other crews about the Nintendos. So I'm towards the warehouse, we had full of power gloves, and I think it was Jimmy who says to Tommy, if your connection can get us anything, then how about gold, you know? Just gold. We can sell that. You know, gold. So Tommy says, okay. And a few days later says to me, go to Hoffman Island. I take a boat out there, it's a cold night, and I start looking around, and there are 12 beautiful golden eggs the size of softballs right there on the ground. This was a huge score. Uh, who told you about the eggs? <sighs> Never mind. I don't want to get you or anybody else in trouble. So Tommy's connection got us these gold eggs. And we take them back to the occupational therapy place where we're operating out of. And they're packed in these heavy garbage bags we used to use. <clears throat> and we take it out and they're just beautiful. They're heavy. They're heavy, but they're beautiful. And once we take them out, they start to flake off. And the flakes, they start moving and floating on the air, almost like dancing in the air. And nobody minds because it's so beautiful. It's like a, like a story or like a, it's like music almost. And you could kind of see people on the little golden feathers. And that's, that's when we realized that they were not real gold. I guess Tommy's connection couldn't do real gold, but whatever. We still had fun. We'd take out an egg whenever there wasn't nothing going on. Then Chicky complained, allergies he said, so we stopped. But that's how we got the name, Tommy the Goose. After the gold eggs, uh, we went back to our bread and butter. Uh, was VCRs, Walkmans, Instamatics, Hi-Fis, microwaves, car stereos, then CDs, laser discs, mini discs, all the discs. Uh, the appetite for this stuff was just huge. I mean, we were millionaires and we weren't even 22. We had everything, but it was never enough for Tommy. You ask Tommy what's new, and he starts to tell you about travertine marble tub sinks and hand-carved cedar facings for the cabinets. Millions of dollars on those two kitchens. 
And I doubt he had one home cooked meal in two years. Some guys gamble or did coke or had wars or whatever, but uh, Tommy was always renovating his kitchen. That was his thing. He had a wife and a girlfriend. The wife knew about the girlfriend, and to put Tommy's package in a vice, she spent these crazy amounts of money ripping up and rebuilding their kitchen. It was insane. Uh, to the point that even the girlfriend heard about it. And then the girlfriend would want to remodel the kitchen, and uh, then we would get back to the wife, and then she'd rip everything and start over. What are you gonna do? He's the boss, and his kitchen's kept being remodeled. So the pressure was on us, and on the connection. Keep the merchandise moving. I was a special agent in the non-regional crimes office on Governor's Island when Tom Vincent came to our attention. Uh, at the time, we called the non-regional crimes department the Island of Misfit Toys. The office was fun. We were all eccentrics or unlucky. There was a gallows humor to the place. We mostly got the cases the other divisions didn't want. It was a tip that got us onto the Roosevelt Island case. Uh, it was a Tuesday in August, and I received a call saying there were 600 microwave ovens in the East River, and did we want to look into it? No one knew if it even was a crime, but I said sure. In non-regional crimes, the biggest risk to an agent is that you might die of boredom. At the time, I was also transcribing wiretaps as a favor to an organized crime task force. I started a movie, so the things that happen in one of my crew if somebody missed a pickup. Huh, that's a waste of a poor bastard. A waste of a waste, huh? You can stay here while we go to the movies. As far as the packages go, is gonna, uh, do cash on that one. And he says he needs an album. Great. I just got the smell of the last one out of the upholstery. No one said to use your car. One of the guys on the wiretap mentioned a few hundred microwave ovens. That said something off for me. We found a hand in one of the microwaves we recovered, but we just chalked it up to the tides. At that time in New York City, anywhere between five and 8,000 people went missing every year. Does that mean that they were abducted and bartered off to aliens in exchange for entertainment systems? Not necessarily. It just means no one ever found out where they went. I mean, the guys, or whatever, that Tommy dealt with, they're smart guys. They work like us. First one's free, then you start to count on it, then the price goes up. Uh, you know, they wanted people, they wanted them alive and delivered in a certain way. Who were they? Who? What? Your connection. As time went on, you sort of found out who they were, didn't you? I mean, you know, I don't care. I'll just say they were fucking aliens or whatever. Yeah, the Roys were around. That's what we called them. Uh, weird guys. Not a lot of fun. But it was made very clear to us that the Roys were to be treated with the utmost respect. No ball busting, about the mittens, no ass grabbing, no taint tickling, no nothing. Where did Tommy say they were from? Well, we were basically informed not to ask. I mean, how much do you want to know? How much do you need to know? We weren't supposed to ask about the Roys, but there was a while there when the Roys were always hanging out. You gotta understand, this was so much money. Every day it was like being first in line at the buffet. And we had the whole city for whatever we wanted, whenever we wanted. For a bunch of kids from Roosevelt Island, it was unbelievable. Not that we didn't work hard. The people we gave the Roys were mostly runaways. Uh, bums, junkies, cat ladies, drunks. Scales, uh, public access TV people. The people we took, they were already gone, really, most of them. And the bodies never turned up. It was dirty work, but uh, that never bothered me, or most of the guys. The recorded history of UFO encounters goes back thousands of years, and they always need people. But for what? That's one of the mysteries. 
You saw the indictments. You know what we were supposed to have been doing with those people. And that would have kept on. It was a reality of the business, and most of the guys were fine with it. But then Tommy switched it up and started to really push the branding. So you got five boroughs in New York City. Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, and Staten Island. Then you got the five families, Bonanno, Colombo, Gambino, and Genovese. But what about Roosevelt Island? What about us? That was what the sixth finger thing was really all about. So you were basically advertising your own criminal enterprise. That was the idea. Tommy called it branding. Did anyone object to the attention you were calling to yourselves? I mean, sure. But we were bringing so much money for the other families, well, what could they do? Did you worry about the newfound attention? Of course. But this wasn't the craziest idea Tommy ever had. By 95, when we locked down our verbal identity matrix, we had a higher Q score than any of the other families. When Tommy first retained my firm, he had a serious problem. I call it the bloody barber chair problem. We could rebrand the business, but we had to start with their look. I made sure that Tommy laid down the law. No matter what the cost, no more barber shops. These guys were going to salons from now on. The problem with marketing is that it's basically a black hole. You can market all day, and the only one who says it's working is the guy you're giving the money to. We had to kick up more and more to Tommy for this multimedia strategy. A business like Six Finger Solutions, they just can't take out a Super Bowl ad. You have to start with what I call recognition by a thousand pinpricks. You get your street teams out there tagging, stenciling, sticker bombing, celebrity t-shirt placements, mentioned on cop shows, playing cards, lighters, ashtrays, you know, the works. History is full of encounters with six-fingered beings. Maybe they're aliens, or maybe they're just experiments, other versions of us. It was that kind of summer. The six-finger family was flamboyant. One day, my son brought home a six-finger family frisbee from school. It was all just supposed to be fun, you know, the way it was presented. But I was on the wiretaps talking to informants who said the Roosevelt Island crew was abducting rummies, wrapping them in polyethylene and dropping them into the river, but we never found the bodies. It was a big campaign, all brand awareness. It was balls to the wall. Uh, we had one guy, Corey or Gary or something, he wanted to be in the family, so uh, went to a doctor and got a six finger sewn onto his hand. Oh, Corey, what a loser. The finger didn't match, and then I think it started to stink, and I think they had to cut, cut off the hand in the end. Tommy was pushing so hard on the marketing campaign. Something seemed off, like our connection, the boys or whatever, was pressuring Tommy to do it. What gave you that sense? It was the way he talked about it. It sounded like a guy who was being squeezed. In some ways it was good. Instead of picking up four or five bums and runaways a week to deliver to the connection, we only had to deliver one or two. But we had to toe the line. They were a colorful client. I remember when I asked to see their sales charts, their customer segments, their go-to-market strategy. Just to gauge the direction of their campaign, they told me to mind my own business. I told them that marketing was my business. If Tommy didn't show up when he did, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. They were a colorful bunch. Would aliens use stolen or counterfeit electronics to pay an organized crime outfit for their marketing campaign? They might. Truth is, a lot of guys didn't like the branding campaign. Uh, and it wasn't just the money we were kicking up. You'd hear people saying, what are we doing? I mean, we're stealing, pimping, dealing, fencing, loan sharking, boozing, and living it up one day. And then the next, we're in these day-long meetings about the crew's verbal signifiers. In a brand awareness campaign, 
the conversation that we're promoting is meant to get people used to the client's brand so that they're comfortable and at ease and receptive when that brand does eventually suggest something to them. I'm like, Tom, I'll follow you to the gates of hell, but you have to tell me what this is really about. And Tommy says, it's a command performance. We want the tape decks, the CD players, microwaves, the two tape VCRs, instant cameras, and they want us to socialize the six-finger visual identity to certain core markets. I was loyal, but I knew it was the beginning of the end for guys like me. And I guess some of the other guys felt that way too. And I guess they looked for other ways to do things. Tommy was the business. He had the connection and he called all the shots. And what me and some other guys figured was that if we could get in with the connection, then maybe things could go a different way. We heard something was going on. We'd hear Tommy literally screaming at people about something he called DDS, but we couldn't figure out what it was. One essential service we perform for our clients is to deconstruct their brand to the atomic level. For Six Fingers, that came down to what we call desire delivery solutions. The consultant rented out uh, half a hall at the Marriott by the airport and spent a whole day showing us charts and slogans to tell us uh, we weren't gangsters, but this other thing, he said that this other thing was the value DNA of the parent brand, you know? What could you do? By this point, Tommy was paranoid. When you wanted to talk about business, you had to type into a speaking spell. Even guys like me. At that point, we had to do something. So we were following him all over town. We had different cars, different boats, jet skis. We had a scuba diver on 24-hour call. We found out Tommy was going to Rat Island for a meeting. A guy on a boat, a little thing with fishing poles, had a walkie-talkie, let us know he saw a jet ski going there around 3 in the morning. The guy in the scuba suit, Nucci. I knew him as a kid, knew his family. We were friends before he went into the Navy. And, you know, we worked together sometimes. Nucci was supposed to hit Tommy right there in front of the Royce. And then me and another guy would pull up in another boat and make the connection understand that this was going to be the new way to do a business. And I guess... Those guys never got their chance, and when we got Nucci back, he wasn't Nucci, he was Nucci's grandfather, and uh, that was pretty much that. There are stories of people being abducted and coming back much older, or even younger. I mean, if you went on a trip at the speed of light for a year, it's possible that more than 100 years could pass on Earth before you got back. Something like that could have happened here. We knew a few things at that point. We knew they used Red Island, and we knew James Nucci was affiliated with the Sixth Finger. We knew he'd grown up with some of the key players in the case that he'd been in the military. But nothing really prepares you for, you know, I don't think I can talk about that part of the case. I was heading toward Nucci, when there was a flash of light, like it was daytime over Rat Island for a few seconds. Me and the other guy in a boat had a little diarrhea in our pants and took off. As soon as I got off the boat, I put my wife on a bus and I called the FBI from Port Authority. Honestly, it wasn't a hard decision to make. In some ways, Charlie was a perfect witness. He'd been in the Roosevelt Island crew since the beginning. He was well-liked, and he was willing to wear a wire. I mean, I was scared, but when the thing happened with Nucci, Tommy was more scared about what his connection was going to do. So he ramped up the pressure on us to raise awareness of the Six Finger brand. By the end, it was all about keeping the Roy's happy. And those fucking... They were all about pasting the Six Finger logo everywhere they could. If you did anything to violate the visual identity, Tommy would have you whacked. 
It got so even the lowliest associate on the corner didn't know his go-to-market storytelling octagon from his prick. We were all so busy being brand ambassadors and value stewards that we didn't see the bust coming. The case was supposed to be a slam dunk between the wiretaps, what we had from Charlie, and all the publicity. By the time we had the warrants, we weren't seizing shipments, we were seizing whole warehouses. They got me at the hair salon. I had that fucking same gel in my hair for a week before I could take a shower. They put me in the room and showed me the tapes, the stuff they confiscated. They had us. It was all over, and we deserved it. We all did. We had a good thing, and we fucked it. But then, as the weeks went on... I don't... I mean, you never want to insinuate. There are reasons that maybe there was, you know, you just have to accept some things. It was a few weeks after the bust, and I was living in the middle of, uh, never mind where I was living. I was off the map, and I heard from the TV that they dropped the case against Tom. I was stunned, just stunned. I didn't think I talked for a whole hour. My lawyer comes in one day and says they're prosecuting me as the boss of the whole Roosevelt Island family, the capo di capi of the Six Finger. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So he asks, who is it then? Who's the boss? I said, nothing. And that was that. I don't know why I was surprised. I mean, how do you hold a guy who can get anything? I, I have heard all the speculations. Uh, and the FBI guys, they pissed in my ears something fierce. But the way I look at it, some things are not a deal. Loyalty is not a deal. Where I give you something and you give me something. Loyalty is about who you are. Those guys, yeah, they were my friends. What can I say? People go their separate ways. I kept my mouth shut and I did my time. I lost my family, my house, my car, boat. I get out, there's no more Walkmans, no Instamatics, no more VCRs even. You know, there's still money, but I don't have any. It's a bad joke. I traded away my life for junk. It was a good brand. It was visual, enigmatic, aspirational. But you have a scandal like that? Almost 2,500 counts of conspiracy to kidnap? Even the strongest brand is going to have to take a breather. I have children now. And there are things. First communion, confirmation, get good grades, get into college, a job, marry. These are good things. But people don't want to get out of bed or put on a tie. So you put out a big spread. You have an open bar, you hand out the envelopes. And even if none of us comes out ahead money-wise in the end, you still do the things. That's how I feel about them, the Roy's, whoever Tommy was dealing with. Maybe we didn't come out ahead, and maybe we screwed up our lives. But we still did something, touched something bigger, even for just a few years. Maybe that's life. It's always something. Just never what you think it is. So, after the Roosevelt Island case, I had my pick of postings. But I didn't want any of them. Not after watching Tommy walk. So I left law enforcement and uh, got on a new path. In hindsight, <clears throat> It was obvious, but nobody saw it. I remember one night early on, it was summer and it just rained. So the whole harbor stank like a crapper at a ball game. Me and well, me and this guy. Anyway, we were doing the thing with some wino, bags over the hands, bags over the feet. Then the whole mummy thing with the visqueen and the breathing straws in the nose and the mouth. And I asked, I asked the guy who I was doing it with, what's going to even happen to this poor slob? And he says, there's going to be nobody and nobody's going to miss him. What do you care? I, I, I 
think I just nodded. I mean, what did I care? And forget what came next, the money and the power and the bust and the crazy shit with custom brand colors and logo lockups. That, there in the boat that night, that was really, that was it for me.